Wilbur. I'm from the Swinomish and Tulalip tribes in Washington State. I'm a photographer, a filmmaker, a writer, and the creator and director of Project 562, which is an effort to photograph all of the tribes in the United States, over 500 sovereign nations. Project 562 is an effort to photograph all of the tribes in the United States, and it was started because we wanted to put together a year-long worth of visual literacy curricula while I was a teacher at the tribal school in my res, and there wasn't enough material to create a comprehensive collection. So that, that's the main reason why I started this project. This is um, my fifth consecutive project that is centered around identity. Yeah, I would say that it's, its primary focus has been focused on identity and aiming to understand what, like, how do we describe, understand, teach uh, contemporary indigenous identity. And so we, we ask each of our participants what it means to be an Indian, um, which was, it was problematic, you know, and so of course we had to change our questions because we know that we can't be Indians, right? Like we can't be something we never were. And... Um, you know, like the definition of an Indian is wrought with, well, not necessarily the definition, but the identity of an Indian is wrought with assimilation and termination and relocation and genocide. And those experiences don't define our people and they certainly don't give us a future. And since extinction is a very real part of the narrative when people consider American Indians, we have to rearrange that thinking so that people imagine indigenous people um, as a part of the present. And so ideally folks would have the opportunity to learn the indigenous history and uh, what it means to be a steward of the place that they're occupying. And hopefully we can create relationships with one another through that, through that process. But yeah, in my experience, uh, Project 562 first started by asking that question, and then, of and then of course, I've realized that the better question is like, what does it mean to be um, like Tulalip or Swinomish or uh, Warm Springs? And then I started to get a more land-based and relationship-based identity answer, where people would say, "We're the people of the tall pine trees," or "The people of the blue green water," or "The people of the four sacred mountains," and and those answers were more related to the original agreements of the land. And then I started to realize that that identity is connected. Since we are land-based, relationship-based people, and started exploring that idea, I realized that all over the country, our people were at the forefront of almost every major environmental protection movement in the United States. And so I started questioning what it means to be indigenous and be relocated or feel displaced even though the fa we haven't relocated at all because the face of Mother Earth has changed so dramatically around us. And so how do we maintain a land-based identity when in many occasions the land that we are from historically did no longer resembles our original identities or our original agreements. Well, I, I go back and forth with the way that I talk about this with young and up-and-coming journalists. And, and in some ways, I, I often, you'll often hear me tout that I, I think that representation of indigenous peoples without consultation and consent um, and a constant um, revisiting of that consent is, is sort of like representation done to us. And I think that the misrepresentation of indigenous people is primarily responsible for many of the misconceptions and therefore the Supreme Court decisions and the policies that affect our people. And I think it's very dangerous when non-Indians report um, or tell indigenous stories. And I think it's dangerous because I think that there's subtle nuance um, to understand and without having a comprehensive education, an indigenous education, without taking American Indian Studies 101, 102, you know, and becoming uh, becoming a, an indigenous scholar of sorts, I, I think that you're, it's really easy to um, to not fully understand the complexity of an indigenous story. And so I would encourage young students to collaborate, to truly find the spirit of collaboration and to ask for permission from not just the one person that they're photographing, but maybe tribal council or tribal elders, or um, f to find a way um, 
to make sure that the people that they're representing are given individual agency over the stories that are told about those, those individuals. If you're going to go into communities of color, then first you have to define the methodology with the people, the stakeholders. And, and a community-based journalism is not a definition that comes from within an indigenous community. It's not an indigenous pedagogy, so it's it's lacking, um, it's lacking in its definition. So I, that's why I asked you. Um, I, I don't think that I don't think that it's been clearly defined the best practices, but we can take from uh, what um, we can take from what different industries are doing in these communities and and take them from their models. Researchers, for instance, in academia. Are, are have been almost com like completely banned from many of our reservations, you know, like because of because of their unethical approach. So, for instance, once in Havasupai, uh, a university came to Havasupai and said, "We want to study your blood, and we're going to help you with this uh, crisis that you have in your community. We're going to help you with diabetes." And so we're, we want to study your, take blood samples and, and see if we can help you. And the people said, yeah, okay. And then of course they took the blood samples and tested them uh, and did genetic testing and studied the sequencing of their DNA and then turned it over to the federal government because the federal government wanted to prove that the supais weren't from that canyon so that they could forcibly remove them from the canyon because they wanted that to be simply reserved for um, a national park system. And they had to fight it in court for a very long time until they finally won. And then precedents had to be set for the ways that uh, research is done in indigenous communities. So these IRBs have to be signed appropriately. And, um, and communities have, uh, and tribal governments have had to create policies for allowing outsiders to come into our communities. And because it's been done so terribly over and over and over again, Many times, if a journalist calls one of our communities, there will just, there's just like a blanket, no comment, don't come here. And so that's a problem, right? Because we need our stories told. Um, but in order for us to be able to do that, we have to create collaborative models and agency has to be given back to the individual in the image. And the decision makers of that community should play a role in that. And then so it forces us to reimagine our ideas of being um, like, unconsciously biased. It, I think it's, it's a really, it's a part of uh, a post 80s generation, a post 70s generation, a post civil rights movement, where we think that we're pos like capable of not seeing color or capable of moving beyond race and so social and class boundaries. And, and now we think that we're, we're post racial in a society where we're, we clearly aren't. And so we have to acknowledge that we come into every circumstance with a very deep biasness. And we, it's through acknowledging that that we shift our perspectives and we shift power. But we cannot until we acknowledge that, that know that that's capable, we're not, or even capable of that. Like your experience growing up wherever you grew up was entirely different than my experience. And we are going to see things entirely differently. We can go to the exact same place, take the exact same image and have the exact same experience. And your commentary is going to be exactly um, as you are. And it is going to be entirely different than, than the way that I see it. And there's, there is, even if we have the conversation over and over and over again about why we see it differently, we are going to have a different experience. And so when the original four founders of people writing about the ethics of journalism were considering this, they were considering it from their own perspective.